Good morning. This is Ian King Live in our business and economic news from the heart of the city. Now, the government has tweaked the terms of its windfall tax on oil and gas production in the North Sea. The move threatened follows evidence of a collapse in investment in the North Sea, which supports some 215,000 highly paid jobs. Well, the government introduced a tax rate of 75% on North Sea oil and gas production when energy prices soared last year following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The 75% levy on North Sea oil and gas production but it will revert to its previous level of 40% if oil and gas prices fall below their long-term average for a period of six months. The floor has been set at $71.40 for a barrel of crude oil and 54 pence a therm for gas. The energy profits levy has raised around £2.8 billion to date. That's according to the government, which expects it to raise almost £26 billion by March 2028. We're going to be speaking very shortly to the uh, offshore, uh, offshore energy production uh, business lobby. Do stay tuned for that. Now, any day now, Vodafone is expected to announce it's merging its UK operations with three. The UK telecoms arm of Hong Kong-based CK Hutchison. It would be the biggest shake-up of the mobile telephony market in this country for many years. And it comes after complaints from Vodafone and others that the market is so crowded it's stifling innovation and investment. But a deal is likely to come under heavy scrutiny from the Competition and Markets Authority. Well, joining me now is Paolo Pescatori. He's the founder of the tech, media and telecoms uh, consultancy PP Foresight Palo, good to see you this morning. I mean, they've been talking to each other for a year, these guys. What's taken so, so long? Good morning, Ian. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. Yes, uh, they've been talking for a while. There's no uh, specific deadline or timings on the deal, but, you know, reports seem to suggest that, you know, we could be days or even weeks away, and who knows? A deal may, a deal may not even happen. So let's see what happens over the next few days. I mean, do you think the CMA is likely to block this? I mean, they did, after all, uh, block a takeover by O2, uh, by, of O2 by 3 uh, in 2016. It's a very good question. So, of course, you know, under the current regulatory environment, and, and as you said, the president has already been set in the, the failed free O2 deal. You know, it really hinges on the balance of whether both entities can really prove the merits of the deal is really in the interest of UK PLC. And, you know, whether, you know, the real test will really come, whether they can prove, you know, there is a failing firm uh, between either one or uh, between of uh, between the two of them, you know, long term, because they're having to invest huge sums of money. And, you know, is it uh, sustainable to have two subscale mobile operators when you have, you know, EE that's been merged into uh, BT and obviously O2 into Virgin Media. So I think that's where it all hinges on. And then, you know, naturally there has to be some concessions that need to be made around the spectrum, network sharing. And if all parties can work together to provide some form of resolution and provide solutions rather than create another problem, then certainly it would stand a better chance of trying to get over the line. You've made the point there that these two are, are fairly subscale compared with the other operators in the market. I mean, Vodafone argues that uh, this is inhibiting investment. Does it have a point? Well, to a certain degree, uh, yes. All mobile operators are investing heavily in upgrading their networks. And of course, you know, we're now moving towards uh, standalone uh, 5G. But naturally, there aren't that many subscribers to actually acquire. And even though both, com both companies have outperformed the market over the last year in terms of net ads, continuing to invest at the rate that they are doing is unsustainable. And even that Ofcom acknowledges that return on capital employed is less for, for these two particular players. And of course, you want to increase competition rather than you know reduce competition. Naturally, when you are reducing the number of players in the market, of course, you're reducing choice. But um, that could be of the benefit to UK PLC from an economic productivity perspective. It would be better to have three stronger players than having you know two and then uh, of course you know from the opposite side of the spectrum they're vertically integrated because even if the deal does get over the line it still doesn't address the the issue that you know the combined entity lacks having that convergence compared to the top two players you mentioned 5g there would the would this merger have any implications for 5g rollout well, to date, we haven't seen a huge impact, but, you know, the argument, I guess, 
both entities would put forward that as a combined entity, you know, they could actually dedicate more resources to the rollout of standalone 5G and then eventually millimeter wave. And then obviously next generation technology, which will obviously be 6G and beyond. All right, Paolo, we've got to leave it there. Good to talk to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, back now to our top story, which is that the government has tweaked the terms of its windfall tax on oil and gas production in the North Sea. The government introduced a tax rate of 75 per cent on North Sea oil and gas production when energy prices soared last year. This morning, it's announced it will drop the levy if prices fall. Well, joining me now is David Whitehouse. He's chief executive of Offshore Energies UK. David, welcome to you. Um, is this going to be enough to get investment going again in the North Sea? Or is the damage already being done? If I could, maybe just to provide some uh, some context, really, on today's announcement. So, so in the UK, 75% of the energy we use comes from oil and gas, and we produce domestically about half of that. I think it, it's very clear for our energy security, for the 200,000 jobs that the sector employs, and actually also for the future energy transition, it's really important that we continue to see investment in the in the oil and gas sector. There is no doubt that the energy profits levy has caused problems. I think uh, from our membership, 90% of the oil and gas operators have said that they've been cutting back our, on investment. And as a sector, we have been calling on the government to do something to, to help us. I think, I think what we hear today is we will get a price trigger, and that's a mechanism that we've been calling for, and we welcome that. So, so a price trigger effectively means that when the windfall is no longer there, windfall tax goes away, and we think that's fair. That's fair for operators. We think that's fair for consumers. We need to work the detail, though. Uh, the, the whole intent of today's announcement is to unlock investment, and we will work with our members, with the oil and gas operators, and actually also with the banks and the lenders, just to confirm that this truly will unlock the investment that the sector, and to be honest, the country needs. What I struggle to understand, David, maybe you can help me with this, is that when the uh, windfall tax was announced, the government sought to sugar the pill by announcing a 91% uh, tax relief on investment in the North Sea. Why hasn't that worked? I think the, ta the tax relief, to some degree, is is of a system. But what we're really looking for, actually, is a stable, long-term, lower tax rate that actually means we've got stable investment uh, going forward. And in some way, shape, or form, we don't want to see those the, those higher higher tax levels driving those those um, higher incentives. I, I think are unhelpful. What we want is stable, long-term. Uh, regime for the oil and gas sector. That means people can plan, people can, can can deliver projects, and actually that's good for the oil and gas sector, that's good for the UK, and ultimately that's good for consumers. Now, uh, you mentioned there a lot of the questions over the detail there. I mean, the floor has been set at $71.40 uh, per barrel of crude and 54 pence per therm on gas. What do you make of uh, where the floor's been set? I think it's something we're going to we'll have discussions with uh, with with Treasury. I think I think we see the gas prices as, as lower than, than uh, as an industry that we were we were looking for. And I think again, for me, this is this is part of the detail and the discussions we need to now have with with Treasury and and actually with with our investors and with lenders just to in, ensure that the uh, that the mechanism that's been proposed today will unlock the investment that the UK needs. Are, are you already seeing job losses in the North Sea following the imposition of the windfall tax? I think, unfortunately, we are. We are. We, you know, we. You hear it. Actually, it's not just uh, not just up here in Aberdeen, but up and down the country. You are seeing jobs uh, being eroded. So, a number of, um, uh, I think, a number of the assets from the North Sea are already disappearing overseas. I think not only is the tax causing an issue, but I think also what is going on in America with the IRA is also, I think, luring the uh, the, the supply chain away. So yes, we are seeing that, and it's really important that we change that. Um, a successful energy transition, a successful oil and gas sector in the UK is really important. We we represent over 400 excellent supply companies, and they're absolutely the the, the supply chain companies that are, that if we can have the investment in oil and gas, they will be there to invest in our future in renewables and actually driving the the energy transition here in the UK. So we are seeing those job losses. Really important that we turn that around. Now, the Labour Party is already critical of the existing uh, levy. It says that uh, it doesn't go far enough. Just put it into context for me, if you would, how the UK taxes oil and gas production compared with some of our, our peer economies. 
So, so what you see is the if you compare the 75 percent that we're currently paying, that's three times more than, than any other company here in the in the UK. And you'll find that there are other there are other tax regimes in the world which uh, which are similar levels, but fundamentally the UK is one of the highest tax regimes now. And I think actually more importantly to some degree. It's also the fact that it's become unstable. What companies look for is stability. They want stability. They want consistency. They want political support. That's what we really need to deliver for the long-term future, not just of the oil and gas sector, but for the energy sector across the entire UK. Now, David, while I've got you, uh, I mentioned the Labour Party just now. They've had a long-standing commitment to borrow £28 billion to uh, fund green investment. It looks this morning as though they may be rowing back on that. Your reaction, please? I think there's a uh, Labour Party uh, policies to, for them to dictate themselves. What I would say, though, is actually for the energy transition, I think is really important to the UK. It's a great opportunity. The North Sea offers some fantastic opportunities. We've powered the country for 50 years, and actually we're going to power the country for the next 50 years through oil and gas, but actually also through offshore wind, through hydrogen and, uh, and carbon storage. So one of the things about today's announcement is it is a step, it's a first step in a, in a longer path of ensuring actually we do attract that investment and we do drive that longer term um, ambition in the energy transition, delivering net zero by 2050 for the, for the UK. All right, David, got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Now, Rishi Sunak and the US President Joe Biden have agreed a new partnership to bolster economic security. The agreement includes a narrow trade pact covering critical minerals needed for electric car batteries, closer defence industry cooperation, easing trade barriers and a new data protection deal. But the Prime Minister has blamed the pandemic and the war in Ukraine for the UK government's failure to strike a full-blown trade deal with the US. Today we have agreed the Atlantic Declaration, a new economic partnership for a new age of a kind that has never been agreed before. Yes, a partnership that protects our citizens, but more than that, a test case for the kind of reimagined alliances President Biden has spoken so eloquently about. Well, the British Chambers of Commerce has uh, upgraded its forecast for UK GDP this year, but warned that the economy is flatlining. It expects a growth rate of 0.3% for the whole of 2023, rising slightly to 0.6% in 2024 and 1% in 2025. Well, joining me now is Vicky Price. She's an independent member of the British Chamber of Commerce's new Economic Advisory Council. Vicky, welcome to you. Before we get into the forecast, I'd, I'd just like your reaction to uh, what Rishi Sunak was saying there. Has he come back with anything substantive, do you think, from the US? Well, I think he has. Uh, we knew anyway that there wasn't going to be a trade deal. It was very clear uh, that that idea has been abandoned by the US, certainly, and the hope of achieving one uh, really wasn't on the cards uh, as uh, the, the actual visit was taking place. Um, but at least what uh, I think we've got back is some commitment to ensure that the whole move in the States to uh, subsidise quite significantly its own industry to encourage more green growth and so on is not going to happen by excluding entirely you know vast chunks of the uk manufacturing sector such as the car industry and of course the europeans are trying to so the rest of europe is trying to do the same thing as well with discussions on how to get integrated into that vast subsidy element because otherwise what you're going to end up uh, looking at in the future is real trade barriers uh, and competitive advantage going to the US at the detriment of us all. So I think that's quite good. So there are some sectoral issues generally that I think are going to look better in the future. And uh, of course, just declaring this close relationship is, is good news because it had drifted away. And I think there could be a lot that we could build on it. Now, we mustn't get too excited about it, but it's certainly better than not having that particular alliance, if you like, that has been declared between the two countries. Well, let's talk about your forecasts. What's uh, informed these upgrades? Well, what we've seen, of course, in the UK is that growth has been slightly better in the last, uh, in the first quarter of uh, the, this year and also slightly better in the previous quarter than had been anticipated of 2022, the last one. Um, and we've seen also consumer spending being um, slightly stronger than had been anticipated. Confidence is a bit better. We've seen the latest data, which still suggests that the consumer is quite confident despite the squeeze in household disposable incomes. And we've also seen investment 
staying slightly higher than anticipated as well. So the resilience of the UK economy obviously needs to be taken into account when you're looking at what may happen in the six months ahead. But what we know is that the growth that we're seeing right now is, is tiny. So when we're forecasting growth of 0.3%, that could go either way. And you've seen what's happened in Europe where they have just, for the Eurozone at any rate, they've just recalculated their figures for the first quarter which was suggesting a slight increase before to now a drop. So they are in technical recession in the Eurozone, not in the EU as a whole. So things could go either way. And I think it's going to be very, very important to look at business sentiment ahead. And any uncertainty in government policy could tip uh, the balance really back into recession. And we certainly are looking at forecasts that are suggesting that maybe there will be the quarter of no growth or best possibly small decline in uh, one of the quarters uh, that follow this one. So we're not really in safe territory yet. And the forecasts are not really by anyone um, anticipating anything big to happen in 2024 and 2025. And that's the real worry. How do we get back to fast growth and fast productivity? I'm very interested there that you say uh, things could go either way. Do, do you see the risks to your forecast being more to the upside or the downside? The worry on the downside uh, has a lot to do with what happens with consumer spending, because, of course, we've had the mortgage increases that have taken place just recently, and they are already affecting people's ability to uh, finance their debts and also remortgage uh, for their household's um, debt that they've got right now, which is becoming considerably more expensive. So there is an issue of, of affordability. If people then react by spending less in other things, given that, of course, right now we still have very high food price inflation, then that could tip things the other way, because as I said earlier, consumer spending has been a very important part of keeping things going. So the services sector continues to grow. On the other hand, you have manufacturing, which is in a recession, has been seeing declines in um, monthly output since last August. So there are chunks of the economy that are don't, not doing very well. Construction has done well because of civil engineering activity and commercial building. But of course, the house building side is also suffering. So the high interest rates and further increases in interest rates that we may indeed see, and we're anticipating that there will be another quarter point rise, could well affect consumer sentiment quite significantly. If that happens, given that services are such a large part of the economy, then indeed we could see a slowdown happening from here on. All right, Vicky, got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. It's good to catch up with you. Thank you. So another business news stories for you now. And the US grains giant Bunga is in talks to create what would be, be one of the world's biggest agricultural trading companies. It's seeking to merge with Viterra, which is owned by Glencore, the FTSE 100 commodity trading and mining company. The combined business would be worth around 25 billion US dollars and it would be one of the world's biggest traders of wheat, corn and soybeans. The deal is likely to be scrutinised closely by regulators, coming at a time when the war in Ukraine has raised many questions about the security of supply in global food markets. The UK-based payment solutions provider Network International has agreed to a takeover, valuing it at £2.2 billion. The buyer is Brookfield, the Canadian asset management company whose existing UK assets include the holiday resort operator Centre Parks and a 50% stake in the property group Canary Wharf. Well, Network was founded in 1994 and provides services and solutions that allow more than 150,000 merchants, mainly in the Middle East and Africa, to accept digital payments from customers. And Amigo Holdings, the failed subprime lender, said today it had received an approach from one of its shareholders that could save it from folding. The company, which began an orderly wind-down of its operations in March, said it had been approached by Michael Fleming, a financier and shareholder, to request an exclusivity agreement in relation to the business. Amigo warned that there was a very low likelihood of a successful conclusion to any discussions and said that even if a deal could be reached, there was not expected to be any value for shareholders. Now, the recent launch of ChatGPT by OpenAI has sparked an upsurge in interest in generative artificial intelligence. But you could be forgiven for thinking that all the running in the technology is being made by the likes of Microsoft and Google. But they are not the only ones. And there's growing interest in Silicon Valley at what Adobe, the software company behind Photoshop, 
is doing in the field. It's been giving away tools on a new website called Firefly, which includes new photo editing tools and a service that can create art and images from a simple text command, similar to OpenAI's DALI app. Well, joining me now is Anil Chakravarthy. He's president of the digital experience business at Adobe. Uh, Anil, welcome to you. Are you trying to uh, build generative AI applications from scratch or are you trying to more to incorporate them into your existing products? Hi, thanks for having me on, pleasure to be on. We are actually using generative AI in a variety of ways. Uh, we are building it from scratch for our uh, uh, imaging products. So we have, you mentioned Photoshop, with Photoshop and the integration of Photoshop with Firefly, anybody who's using Photoshop can just enter a prompt and say, hey, put a boat for me here, or I want a picture of a lighthouse, and they can actually edit their images and make their images more beautiful with the use of generative AI. That is technology built from scratch. Uh, we also are integrating with generative AI for across our other applications, including uh, the large language models like you mentioned with OpenAI. So we're doing both. How rapidly do you see AI becoming incorporated by companies into their workflow processes? Yeah, I think the AI is going to be transformative uh, in its use across all kinds of applications. Uh, I have to give you an example. We are building what we call a co-pilot for uh, marketers. You know, this show here that we are here in London, uh, it's called our Adobe Summit. It's been attended by a number of uh, marketers around uh, Europe. And what they're all trying to do is how to do better personalized marketing, deliver better customer experiences to all of their customers, whether it's through their digital channels like their web and mobile apps, or for people who come into their stores or through other venues and channels. The way they do that is through the use of AI to really better understand who, which customer segments to serve, what they care about, how to put better experiences in front of them, and do it at the right time through the right channels. All of that's being made possible through AI. Now, you're rolling out Firefly at the moment to your enterprise customers. How much are they going to have to pay for it? Firefly is right now uh, in beta uh, with uh, Photoshop. Uh, any customer who already has Photoshop has access to Firefly through Photoshop. So that's already included in their Photoshop uh, in the subscriptions they acquire from us for the Creative Cloud. We also have a new product called Adobe Express that is, uh, that's available to all customers. We just announced Express for enterprise customers. So as a part of the Express uh, uh, products, now these, uh, these prices for enterprise customers depends on the number of seats or users that they have, as well as the number of uh, images they intend to generate. Based on that, there will be pricing and packaging based on that. Obviously, there's a big debate going on right now about uh, potential regulation of, of AI, but as a developer, how do you stop your customers from abusing the service? We have a number of things that we're doing. We have something called the Content Authenticity Initiative. The Content Authenticity Initiative was actually started initially to help uh, counter misinformation, deep fakes, and things like that. And that has come in, obviously, at a perfect time for AI. We allow every customer who uses Firefly, every image that's generated through uh, uh, Firefly, will have content credentials showing how it was generated. So we have content credentials that show whether something was created by a human being, whether it was created by AI, and then as it gets changed, we track what changes happen to it. So that's really important to make sure that you know the origin of any kinds of images that you generate, any kind of uh, other um, content that you have uh, on the open uh, uh, internet. You know where it's come from, who uh, generated it, what changed, and these kinds of content credentials, this kind of content authenticity is a critical part of making sure that it is accurate information. How are you building safeguards into Firefly to ensure that uh, people who use it don't, for example, infringe the copyright of, of copyright owners and, and characters? That's exactly right. So the way Firefly has actually been trained, it has been built to be commercially safe. So what we have done is made sure that every image that it was trained on, all the data sets that went into the uh, AI models were licensed images. So we have made sure that everything there, nothing was scraped off the internet, everything was licensed, and we make sure that all the inputs are licensed there. In addition, we make Firefly models available for every enterprise customer for their own data set. So for instance, if you are a brand and you have the trademarks for your particular brand, you have an instance of Firefly where you can import those images, you train that on the, on the Firefly data set, 
and the generated images are only for your exclusive use. They are not made available to other people who don't have access to your uh, images. So that's how we make sure that intellectual property, copyrights are protected uh, as, uh, as the use of Firefly uh, becomes widespread. Anil, it's been fascinating talking to you this morning. Thanks very much indeed for joining me. Thank you. Me on. Still to come here on Ian King Live, we're going to have a look at how the markets are going into the weekend. Stay with us. I think the rise is mainly in the younger age group, so the under 24s. Uh, and what we're seeing is, and we've been seeing this for a number of years, the, the a change in sexual behaviour, so the, the hookup culture. There's more casual sex, especially in this, this age group as well. Um, in addition, there, there has been some budget cuts. Um, and that has meant that the educational side of things has diminished as well. So we're not teaching the younger younger adults about sex and safe sex in the way we used to teach them. So that's caused a bit of a perfect storm in, in the fact that there's a change in behaviours, especially after people have come out of the pandemic um, and being locked down, and there's been less education about things that a lot of the, the, the people who were young in the 80s took for granted about condom use and, and safe sex. And a lot of young adults find it quite difficult to talk to their parents about their current sexual behaviour and and, um, and some of the activities. And, and, and a massive part of what the that pro, those programs used to do was give out free condoms and and teach about consent and teach about the wider sexual behaviour. We look after any child in terms of how they're dealing in the social environment and what's going on at home. Um, and we're open to have the conversation. So if anyone who is under the age of 18 but having sex, we, we call it gillet competence, which, which if they can consent, we talk through safe sex and um, contraception. They are usually quite easy to treat. Gonorrhea is a strange one because gonorrhea, there is a very resistant strain of gonorrhea at the moment, um, which needs a slightly longer course of antibiotics. Um, and so that's why testing is so important. Knowing that you have these, syphilis has, has been at the highest level since 1948. Wow. Um, Goodness. Yes. Since and that's just after the war. Exactly. And that's because people are, their behaviours are changing and people don't know the signs of it. It's almost like we almost eradicated it. And people aren't picking up the early signs of it because it's not painful and it can disappear for long periods of time. Well, Wall Street's solid finish last night was followed by gains for equities in most of the Asia-Pacific region overnight. The Nikkei in Tokyo rose to finish close to the 33-year high it hit on Tuesday to complete its ninth consecutive weekly gain. Well, in Europe, stocks have been mixed this morning. Here's the current picture. You can see the DAX in Germany are slightly underwater there. The other uh, main three continental European indices just about in positive territory. Talking points this morning include Dassault System. The software maker is off 2.5% in Paris following a trading update. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 is pretty flattish there. It's uh, three points off right now. Consumer stocks weighing on the index to an extent. The leading blue chip faller in percentage terms is quite a big one uh, to mention here this morning. Croda. The speciality chemicals group is down some 14% right now following a profits warning. Among leading FTSE gainers right now is AstraZeneca. That follows news that the US healthcare regulator has backed the use of an antibody AZ has been developing with Sanofi of France to tackle respiratory infections in children. Outside the FTSE 100, the North Sea oil and gas producer Harbour Energy has rallied nearly 3% after the government's floor on the North Sea windfall tax. Rival Ithaca Energy is ahead by 2.5% for similar reasons, says AstraZeneca. Uh, on the foreign exchange markets, uh, I think we can show you what's uh, going on there. Here we go. A sterling uh, off uh, an eighth of 1% right now against the US dollar, more or less unchanged against the euro. Meanwhile, the single currency is also off by around a fifth of 1% against the dollar. As for the oil price, well, that's set to fall for the second week running. That's large, largely on demand concerns. So as you can see right now, it is ahead. Barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $76.31 a barrel. That is up a little under half of 1% on the session. Joining me today, back by popular demand, is Bill Dinning, Chief Investment Officer at Waverton Investment Management. Bill, good to see you this morning. Let's start with Japan. I mean, um, it really is on an absolute tear, the Nikkei. Well, it is. And I, it's very interesting. You know, foreigners uh, sort of were very excited a few years ago when uh, Prime Minister Abe sort of started his reform programme. And then uh, it, they lost interest. And it was, a, it was a real sort of round trip. I think foreigners bought, you know, the same... They bought 250 
billion or something, a huge amount of, of money. And then they sold it. And recently they've come back. And I think that's quite interesting. I, and I, we think there's a lot of very good Japanese companies, I mean, globally competitive leaders in certain industry, industries. And so I, I think Japan is definitely back, but there's potentially an awfully long way to go because domestic investors in Japan are still incredibly bruised by what happened 30 odd years ago. And yeah. I think to really get that momentum in the market, it's going to require more than just the foreigners. I've seen one piece suggesting that uh, a lot of this interest in Japan from foreign investors is because people no longer want to have their money in China. Yet if they want to retain exposure to a major Asian economy, Japan's really the obvious choice. I think that is a part of it. We've got, we have an uh, ASEAN, a Southeast Asian equity strategy. And we're seeing some real interest from American uh, institutional investors. And a lot of them are actually talking to us about the fact that they're keen to think about Asia ex China. So with all of the political uh, issues between the United States and China, a lot of US institutional investors, some of them will be in the public sector, some of them might be in academia, some of them might be in areas where they, they are nervous about doing things that the, the government may not wish them to do. There's definitely, I think, a move of capital out away from China from US investors. That should be the benefit, hopefully, of our Southeast Asian strategy. But also, I agree with you, it could well benefit Japan. Yes, yeah, fascinating. Now, closer to home, of course, we learned this week that the Eurozone is, is in a technical recession. Is that something you're particularly worried about? I mean, it's a very, very shallow downturn. Well, I? yes. I mean, I, I think, yes. It's, it's technically, yes. I think the, what we continue to be mostly worried about is what's happening in the United States. With the US economy, particularly the US consumer, has continued to be remarkably resilient, and that's kept the US economy uh, growing more than a lot of people had expected, ourselves included. Uh, we still think there's an over 50% probability of a recession in the States, but I would have embarrassingly said that six months ago, <laughs> uh, and it hasn't happened yet, and it's that consumer uh, perseverance that, that matters, I think. And I, I think what, we'll hope, what I suspect will happen is that the US consumer will slow. If that happens, then I think that's a challenge further challenge both here in the UK, also in the Eurozone. Quite often, Europe, you know, on, on this side of the Atlantic, our economic cycle is, tends to be pretty coincident with the US. So if we're already quite sluggish here, you were talking earlier about slight upgrade in expectations in the UK, but again, we're talking, you know, tenths of a, a, tenths of a percent. If the US economy does slow, then I think with an already weak economy in Europe, then that could get more problematic later in the year. All right, always good to see you, Bill. Thanks Thank for joining you. me today. Still to come here on Ian King Live, keeping the gas flowing. I'll be joined by the chief executive of National Gas to talk about maintaining supplies. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Well, with temperatures this weekend set to hit their highest level so far this year, you may not be thinking too deeply just now about your energy bill this winter. But with wholesale gas prices still higher than they were before the war in Ukraine and tight margins between supply and demand for gas across Europe, there is still plenty of reason to be cautious. Well, helping keep gas flowing smoothly between Britain and Europe is one of the priorities for National Gas, which operates the gas transmission network, manages 7 million gas metres and incorporates the gas system operator. The chief executive of National Gas is John Butterworth and he's with me now. John, welcome to you. How concerned should people be about security of supply this winter? Yeah, good morning. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, um, you know, we've got this covered. Um, our key role um, for the UK is to make sure that we have resilience and security of supply. So the 23 million domestic customers, the half a million industrial customers, and the power generators, on average in 2022, we did about 38% of power. We're making absolutely sure now throughout the summer that our system is resilient and we've got everything in place so we can, we can get through next winter. So just what are you doing to build resilience? Yeah, so lots of things are going on right across the enterprise. You know, we take gas from the beach, uh, we move it through enormous pipelines through a series of gas turbines and dispatch it to the cities where we blend it as it comes on shore uh, and filter if it needs fil and filter it. So, um, you know, what we're doing is making sure that all of our assets are in tip top condition, that all the key parts that are needed are on each individual site. We've double shifts and resilience and we're working with government who've been extremely supportive and off gem to make sure that everything is as best as it can be as we head into winter. Obviously, we don't have the storage facilities in the UK that some of our continental European peers do. Why isn't more being done to address that? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, with government, you know, we're looking at that. But, you know, we're in a great place in the UK because we've got the jewel in the crown of Europe, which is the North Sea. So we've got gas supplies that can come in from the North Sea. We've got gas supplies coming in from the Irish Sea. And we've got our enormous LNG terminals that can bring cargo in as well, as well as storage on the mainland. So, you know, we are in a good place for winter. Now, you're also investing very heavily in hydrogen. You're a great believer in that. What uh, are the chances of it ever fully replacing natural gas? Is that likely, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if you think about it, you know, there's three times as much energy this morning going through the gas system than the whole of the electric system. And on a winter's day, it's five times greater uh, than goes through the electric system. And tens of thousands of businesses from fish and chip shops to, um, you know, cement works and, and lots of homes, you know, they can't electrify. So the only option is to move and lean into hydrogen from natural gas. And we have an enormous plan and a big test site on the Scottish border where we are currently working through slowly blending at low levels of hydrogen in the gas stream up to 100% by 2050. You know, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you know, and I'm from Manchester and the sun does not shine that often, it's really important that the balancing mechanism for the huge amount of energy this country uses is hydrogen. So it's important that we get that up and running and introduce it into the gas network as fast as possible. Now, until fairly recently, you were part, of course, of National Grid. You've just been demerged from there. The, the grid still retains a 40% stake in you. How quickly would you expect that to be sold down? Yes, yeah, so we would expect that to be sold down, and that's in train at the minute by the end of the year. OK. Now, one of your uh, new owners, of course, is Macquarie, the uh, Australian investment bank, pr previously an, an owner of Thames Water, uh, during which time they didn't exactly cover themselves in glory. How can you be sure they're not going to do to you what they did to Thames? Well, you know, I can only talk from my experience. We were, the, the deal took place in February of this year. And, you know, they, they have invested and, and they bet the farm on hydrogen. And, uh, they, you know, they are there with masses of investment to put forward already to help us lean into hydrogen for the future. So, you know, I'm really pleased and delighted uh, with Macquarie uh, and the other investors because they want to get involved in transforming us in the UK to hydrogen. And, and that's really important because most properties in the UK are not suitable for a heat pump. 84% of all the houses that are around, are around today are the same houses that will be around in 2050. 
So it gives us the opportunity to give people choice and businesses choice. So people can choose whether they want a heat pump, a hydrogen ready boiler, et cetera, et cetera. So that everybody out there has got the choice and the affordability to make a good decision for themselves. So we're delighted with Macquarie because they're leaning into hydrogen and putting the money where their mouth is. OK, John, we have to leave it there. Good to talk to you this morning and uh, hopefully you do get a bit of sunshine up in uh, Oldham this weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, stock exchanges globally have had to invest heavily in technology in recent years to support activities such as high-frequency trading and see off possible cybersecurity threats. At the same time, though, earnings from their traditional activities have been squeezed by regulators, obliging them to diversify into activities such as data provision and clearing services. Well, the biggest market operator in the EU is Euronext, which runs the stock exchanges of Paris, Amsterdam, Milan, Brussels, Dublin, Lisbon and Oslo. I've been speaking to its chief executive, Steph and began by asking him about his priorities for the next 12 months. We need to make sure that Euronext, which is much larger at the time of the IPO, uh, and which is a group which is already very diversified away from cash equity trading, which represents now only 20% of the top line of the group, is, is much more diversified in non-equity uh, businesses in non-volume related businesses. You've obviously carried out a number of acquisitions over recent years. Mm -hmm. There's still more to come, I'm sensing, from what you've said. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, 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 and I would make a difference between the consolidation of exchanges, where you have to basically be ready when those assets are actionable, when, when the owners decide to, to, to sell. I mean, that's what we've done in Norway, where we waited for the assets to become for sale, and what would you have done in, in, uh, in Italy, where we waited until LSE was put in a situation where, for antitrust reasons, they had to sell the Borsa Italia Group. So the other significant assets in Europe that are possibly uh, going to, to, to evolve in their uh, shoulder base uh, will have to, to, to be ready if and when. For the diversification uh, ambition, it's a bit different because the universe is much wider, be in funds distribution, in post-trade, in uh, forex, in commodities, in data. There is always asset rotations among private equity owners, among uh, industrial groups that, that decide to carve out certain assets. So here uh, we, we monitor situations, we enter into dialogues, uh, in most cases we, we, we submit non-binding offers and we withdraw. Sometimes we, 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 we continue. So, like in any uh, very systematic uh, M&A process. But I'm confident that with valuations changing, with uh, the impact of uh, interest rates increase and, and the new momentum in the private equity world, I'm confident that there will be a much more significant trend of uh, asset rotation, hence many opportunities for us. Now, you've maintained a very significant presence here in London post-Brexit. How has the business changed since Brexit? We have uh, far more people in our London office now than we had in, in, uh, in 2018. And, um, and that's because uh, we have made uh, several acquisitions and some of the acquisitions we have made at teams in London that we have gathered. But it's also because we have significantly increased our commercial uh, effort in, in, in London. The reality is that some decision makers have decided to relocate operations within the EU. Others have decided to stay in London. So we have uh, um, um, uh, developed our commercial efforts in accordance to this new location. Clearly, if you want to uh, bank uh, uh, European clients, if you want to operate on European venues, you need to be based within the EU. Uh, that, that There is no magic about that. Uh, London used to be the largest financial centre of the European Union. It's now the largest financial centre of the United Kingdom with global ambitions and with a very strong leading position on some asset classes, in particular Forex or, 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 or post-trade, for example. But when it comes to financing the real economy, when it comes to listing, to, to equity trading, to anything which is, even, even to corporate bonds, anything that is closer to, to, to the needs of, of the issuers or to managing the savings of, of, the, of the retails, 
then clearly you need to be close to operations and therefore to be regulated in the EU. So this, this polarization started for Euronext. The, what is interesting is that uh, I started in 15. Uh, the Brexit referendum took place in June 16. And in parallel to the Brexit process, the long process between uh, uh, June 16 and, and February 2021, 20, uh, we, um, we have built a company that uh, had at the beginning a 400 million top line, which now has a 1.5 billion top line, which has at the beginning a, a 1.4 billion uh, market cap, which has now a market cap between 7 and 8 billion. So um, in parallel to Brexit, we have built a platform in Europe, consolidating local exchanges, building a leadership in listing, building a leadership on, uh, on cash equity trading. So those two processes have, have developed in parallel. There's obviously a big debate going on in London right now about the attractiveness of, of the UK as a destination to list. Are you seeing any signs of, of that in some of the territories where you have exchanges? Yes, we, we, we see a, a massive shift. On the one hand, if you want to list in Europe now, you prefer to list within the European Union. And if you want to list in Europe, you have an option now to list in a market which is much bigger than the London market, which is the Euronex market. We have a single liquidity pool, a single order book, a single technology platform that uh, uh, trades today between 10 and $12 billion per day in average day volumes, which is approximately twice the volumes traded on on, on, uh, in London. So, as I said earlier, uh, when it comes to equity, to issuers, to the financing of the real economy, clearly there has been a shift uh, from London, which was an offshore platform, to the core of Europe, because Euronext is now able to, to address those needs. That's uh, Stefan Bujna from Euronext to, talking to me earlier. A bit of breaking news to bring you. The University of Manchester has said this morning it has been the victim of a cyber attack. Its systems have been uh, accessed by an unauthorised party and some data accessed. It says it's working around the clock to resolve this. In the meantime, the National Crime Agency, the Information Commissioner's Office and the National Cyber Security Centre have all been informed. Still to come here on Ian King Live, we're going to have a look at what's in the business pages this morning. Don't go away. I think the rise is mainly in the younger age groups, so the under 24s. Uh, and what we're seeing is, and we've been seeing this for a number of years, the, the a change in sexual behaviour, so the, the hookup culture. There's more casual sex, especially in this, this age group as well. Um, in addition, there, there has been some budget cuts. Um, and that has meant that the educational side of things has diminished as well. So we're not teaching the younger younger adults about sex and safe sex in the way we used to teach them. So that's caused a bit of a perfect storm in, in the fact that there's a change in behaviours, especially after people have come out of the pandemic um, and being locked down, and there's been less education about things that a lot of the, the, the people who were young in the 80s took for granted about condom use and, and safe sex. And a lot of young adults find it quite difficult to talk to their parents about their current sexual behaviour and, and, um, and some of the activities. And, and, and a massive part of what the that pro, those programs used to do was give out free condoms and and teach about consent and teach about the wider sexual behaviour. We look after any child in terms of how they're dealing in the social environment and what's going on at home. Um, and we're open to have the conversation. So if anyone who is under the age of 18 but having sex, we, we call it gillet competence, which, which if they can consent, we talk through safe sex and um, contraception. They are usually quite easy to treat. Gonorrhea is a strange one because gonorrhea, there is a very resistant strain of gonorrhea at the moment, um, which needs a slightly longer course of antibiotics. Um, and so that's why testing is so important. Knowing that you have these, syphilis has, has been at the highest level since 1948. Wow. Um, Goodness. Yes. Since and that's just after the war. Exactly. And that's because people are, their behaviours are changing and people don't know the signs of it. It's almost like we almost eradicated it. And people aren't picking up the early signs of it because it's not painful and it can disappear for long periods of time.
tap into the latest news and insight. Invest in your future. Sky News Financial Reports, sponsored by Interactive Investor. Invest in your future. Sky News Financial Reports, sponsored by Interactive Investor. Time now for a look at this morning's business pages. And the Financial Times splashes its print edition with news that the hedge fund manager Odi Asset Management is facing a widening investigation by the UK's Financial Conduct Authority and the loss of crucial banking relationships. It comes after an FT investigation in which 13 women made allegations of sexual assault and harassment against the firm's founder, Crispin Odi. That story followed up more or less everywhere right now. The FT is currently leading its digital editions. Meanwhile, with Donald Trump's claim that he's been indicted on federal charges in connection with classified documents found at his Mar-a-Lago residence in Florida. The Times leads its business pages with news uh, we brought you this time yesterday that the Euro's entered a technical recession. It also reports that Paris is claiming to have overtaken Frankfurt in the battle to win finance jobs that have been created in continental Europe as a result of Brexit. Meanwhile, the Daily Telegraph leads its business pages with news that HSBC has pulled all of its current mortgage offers after being overwhelmed by Russia applications from customers looking to lock in deals before interest rates rise again. It also reports on its business front page that Marks & Spencer has won a dispute with the confectionery company Swizzles after accusing it of copying its Percy Pig suites. Well, with me this morning is Neil Collins, the financial markets commentator and Evening Standard columnist. Neil, good to see you this morning. Mm -hmm. Love to get your reaction to what the government's announced this morning on the uh, energy windfall tax. Well, on the face of it, it's good news because it is a sort of tax cut, but really it does display the sort of complete shambles at the heart of how taxation is, uh, is made in this country. Uh, and it's an admission that the last time they put the taxes up was a serious error. And we've seen the way that the industry has reacted um, by threatening to cut jobs and stopping uh, developments in the North Sea, um, because it's just not worth doing. You know, if all the, the, the profits are going to be taxed away, what's the point? Uh, and it's all very well him saying now that if the oil, if the oil price falls far enough, then we'll uh, cut the tax rate. But um, what's to say that he won't change his mind if the oil price goes up again or um, in, invent some other system to, uh, to, to, to skim still more off for the state? You know, if I was a, uh, running an oil company, an oil exploration company, I would say, well, thanks for this, but really it's stability that we want, stability and fair taxation that we want. And at the moment, we really haven't got either. And there are other places to look for oil other than the North Sea, uh, which will produce no benefit at all to the UK. So um, I just, I despair, really. You know, they just don't seem to have any coherent plan of what they should be doing. But it's worth remembering that... Uh, Sunak, when he was chancellor, uh, ruled out uh, a windfall tax on the oil companies. Uh, and then when he became prime minister, um, his new chancellor changed the rules to impose one. So, you know, this is a long term industry and 10 years is the sort of planning uh, horizon. And you can't plan sensibly if the rules are being changed every few months. And I, I despair at the, the government's inability to see this, uh, just because they were pushed by popular demand into, into imposing the so-called windfall tax on the oil companies last year. Uh, it, it's, 
you you react in that sort of knee-jerk way, this is the sort of consequence that you get. And I don't think we should be surprised. Yes, population populism never makes for good policies, does it? Neil, we've got to leave it there, I'm afraid. Good to see you this morning. Thank you. Pleasure. That's it from me. There's much more on the Sky News mobile app and on the website with reporting video content and analysis from our business team. Among the pieces up there right now, look from me at who the potential runners and riders are uh, to buy the Daily Telegraph, Sunday Telegraph and Spectator magazine. Do have a look at that if you can. Well, after this short break, it's Sam Washington with the latest reaction to the uh, government's uh, move on the windfall tax this morning. I'm back on Monday at 10 o'clock. Hope very much to see you then. Thanks for joining me today. Have a great weekend. Cheerio.